available um, in our gift, sh gift shop uh, this next summer coming up. So this is from again from our 1978 directory. Once upon a time, not too long ago, in a village by the sea, a group of artists and craftspeople had a dream. That dream was to have a place in which to show the creative results of their imaginations without the restrictions of a juried show. The people who got together and formed the Sadas Festival remembered the pioneer artists of Laguna Beach who during the Depression years hung their paintings and crafts on fences along the highway to sell to folks coming through town. Taking their courage from the example set by those brave early settlers, the Sadas founders created their own non-juried show. It has been an outstanding success. People like the carefree, relaxed, happy atmosphere and the warmth and friendliness of the artist. These qualities have remained in each Sadas festival since the beginning. The Sadas festival is still a non-juried show. The creative work and the unique booze reflect the free, easy, imaginative vitality and the energy of the artist. There's no concrete jungle here. The exhibitors design and construct anew their own booze every year. The results are free form, fanciful, and fun. What was once a dream has come true. The Sadas Festival continues to reflect the courage, originality, creativity, and friendliness of those pioneer Laguna Beach artists who dared to be different. Now, I know that sounded a little romantic probably, but it does reflect, uh, it does reflect who we are, the fanciful, free atmosphere of the Sadas. And I know most of you have been there, so you, you know what I'm talking about. So what, I, uh, what I'm gonna do now is give you a, uh, a brief overall view of our history. I don't know if we're gonna have any uh, PowerPoint or not. It doesn't look like we are because we've had, which isn't surprising to me, t uh, some problems with our technology, but um, that just happens. So and, uh, I know that pictures are worth a thousand words, but we're just gonna have to forego that uh, tonight. So um, I'll start in 1965. In 1965, about 30 artists, uh, most of whom had been rejected from the juring system at the Festival of Arts. They decided to form an alternative art summer festival here in town. And they found a lot across the street from the Laguna Beach Library uh, owned by the Peacock family. And those 30 artists set up shop there and from what I hear, the sales weren't that brisk, actually. Um, I have a friend, Steve Krantz, whose father, Robert, and mother, Mia, uh, had a booth there. And uh, Mia made little hand figurines and sold a few of those. Uh, Robert was a painter, and he had one sale for that summer and was quite happy, actually, to make that sale. Um, in 1966, there was no show at all because the primary leader of the 1965 show, Dolores Farrell, uh, moved to Hawaii for a year, and, uh, but returned. And in 1967, uh, along with some emerging new leaders, there was a second attempt for an uh, alternative summer show and um, Dolores Farrell, along with uh, an uh, astute businessman named uh, Ed Van Dusen, Marilyn Zapp, and Frank Torriello, and Larry Cronquist, um, whose son Robert still is running a gallery on a North Coast highway, they organized a second show uh, near Larry's uh, studio by Myrtle and the Coast Highway, and about 75 artists uh, set up shop there and the show became a success. Uh, lots of people came. Uh, it was a kind of a cramped venue because the lot was fairly small. And, uh, but they managed to put on the show. 
Because of the dirt lot, they spread sawdust on the grounds, and that's where the Sawdust Festival got its name. The LA Times ran an article and called it the Sawdust Festival, and that was the first time that was mentioned. Um, so when that summer show was over, uh, they realized, uh, the artists realized they needed a bigger venue, they needed a bigger place in which to show their, their art, and they began looking around for the whole winter and the early spring. They couldn't find uh, any place. They kind of narrowed it down to maybe the boys club. But then out of nowhere, a couple named Walter and Dorothy Funk, who owned two and a half acres at 935 Laguna Canyon Road and were emerging copper enameling artists and wanted to be a part of the show they offered their two and a half acres to the artists who were in the 67 show uh, with the one condition that they be allowed to participate. <laughs> and so the Sawdust was, uh, members were overjoyed. Uh, and well, here comes Bob Cronquist now, is just talking about his father. We're overjoyed, uh, and uh, the Funks leased the grounds for the 1968 show for $900 that first summer. So the contract was signed in May and everything started going well. Everybody started getting, getting prepared for what would be a mid-July opening. Uh, the early years of the Sawdust, uh, we were not open nine weeks like we are now. We were open six weeks and we started uh, in the middle of July, and we go to the last Sunday of August. And that six six week show was just as successful, if not more successful, than any nine week show uh, that we've ever had. So um, things were going along smoothly until April 24th, 1968, three weeks before we were to open for the 68 show, 60 mostly painters at a board of directors meeting bolted from the sawdust, uh, miffed mostly over the increasing a hippie feel that was happening amongst the artists. Uh, and there was a lot of craftspeople coming. And then experimental ideas for light shows and, and creative entertainment. And there was a big division and those 60 artists went back to the 1967 dirt lot, and that was the beginning of the art affair. So there we were, three weeks before the show was to open. They took also our bank account, <laughs> because I think they had contributed most of the money, actually. And so they, there we were with no money, uh, and two and a half acres, and three weeks to open. And so, as is typical with the Sawdust artists, they just figured it out. They rallied, they worked hard. Bob Young, some of you might know that name, uh, took a pickup truck to a uh, junkyard in Santa Ana and found every funky weird thing he could find in the junkyard and brought it back and spread it around the Sawdust grounds. Um, and I can tell you a few things that, uh, that he found uh, at that junkyard. He, uh, he found uh, a three-story sectional aircraft crane, a winch, an ancient farrier's wagon, and the hulk of a fire engine. And those are some of the first booths in the sawdust. They set up uh, some plywood for some of the painters and some of the artists made a little more of a creative effort in their booze, and the 68 show opened, and uh, thus began our journey at 935 Laguna Canyon Road. Um, as is true in anything in life, you pay your dues. You, you have to, you have to uh, not give up in the beginning and keep plugging away and persevering. And uh, the first three or four shows, when you read through the board minutes, uh, 
struggled somewhat to keep going, but the spirit of the sawdust was stronger than, uh, than any challenges that they were facing. And so, uh, now there's still a debate today, by the way, going back to the 65 and 67 show, whether those were the beginning years of the sawdust or just kind of precursors or forerunners to the sawdust. And we have this political debate going on to this very day. And if you know artists at all, you know the debates can get pretty intense. So, but um, 68 was the first year at our current site, current site now. In 1972 came the big year. Uh, Dorothy and Walter Funk, owners of the property, decided to sell. They wanted to move out of town, and uh, they offered us first rights. Well, we didn't have a nickel. We didn't have a nickel in 1972. And the board of directors tried to figure out, like, how can we buy this property? And what they decided to do, they decided to charge admission for the very first time. And in 1972, admission to the status became 25 cents. And what happened? Their faith was honored because the crowds increased, and when the show was over, we had enough for a down payment. And we bought that property, and the board was shocked that we actually were able, they, they had, I mean, the Sawdust Festival is an artist-run show. There are no professionals on the board of directors. It's all artists. Like, we just don't know very much, except we love the Sawdust, and we figure it out. And so, um, and so we bought the property, and, and that, that meant that we had, to, we had to enclose the sawdust. So for the first time in 1972, there was a perimeter wall. And, uh, and then we charged 25 cents. And if somebody came in the front gate and complained that last year it was free, we just let them in free anyway. <laughs> in 1973, our, our, our festival began to like really grow and the counterculture of the joining together uh, of the independent spirit and creative spirit of that era uh, combined with what was really becoming a really interesting, fantastic show uh, with some really creative uh, art and crafts and the grounds were amazing. We, at the time, city regulations were not really in place much so we had four and five story uh, booths. We were open from 10 in the morning till midnight and half the artists never went home after midnight. I mean, it was just, it was just a scene. It was a happening back then. Well, in, in 1973, I met my wife who's sitting here in the front row, Nikki. And, um, and then uh, we were at a meeting uh, shortly after we got married in 1974 and uh, I was, I, was asked to be sales manager because I was married to Nikki and they trusted Nikki, so they asked me to be sales manager. And I was there for the next uh, 35 years uh, as a sales manager. And I was right, so when the sawdust exploded, that was like the second year that I was, that I was uh, uh, there and sales manager. And, uh, and 1974 through 1979, uh, the crowds were enormous. Uh, there were there were many many Saturdays and Sundays where we had six to eight thousand people coming in uh, in one day, and in July of 1978, on a Sunday, ten thousand people came to the Sawdust, and in a six-week show, we had three hundred and twenty-five thousand paid admission come to the Sawdust. I mean, it was unbelievable. You couldn't even hardly see the ground half the time if you were walking, you know, it was, it was crowded. Kind of like any of you been to our opening or our closing, it's kind of like that every day. I mean, you can imagine 325,000 people in 40 some days, and just figure the math out on that, how many thousands that is every day. So, uh, and then uh, moving from the 70s into the 80s, we uh, continued on, uh, and it was at that point that city regulations uh, begin to be more strict and more numerous. And uh, many city officials came and said, uh, we don't think this four-story building with, with extension cords everywhere is gonna work anymore. And so um, the sod is beginning to take on uh, you know, more of a, a, a 
structured look to it in, in the 80s, and at that point, uh, we began to hire staff. We had never had staff before. It was, we all, all Losados was run for the first uh, 14 plus years by, by the artist, by all volunteers. Nobody was paid. Uh, and then we got a general manager in the early 80s, um, and our facades began to re kind of reflect uh, the, the feel of the 80s. Um, and we put up a fresh facade from, uh, from 1968 until 1988. We put up a different fresh facade every year. And there were some great, uh, uh, really interesting different facades that we uh, created. But the uh, city uh, began uh, increasing some regulations and it became clear to us that we needed to put a permanent uh, facade on and some permanent buildings, permanent bathrooms. We were, we had, you know, we we're bringing porta potties in and things like that and we just had to shape things up. So in 1989, we built our, the facade that is now currently seen by all of you and we've had that ever since and there's talk about changing that some now, but uh, in 1989, that was our first year as we moved into the 90s, uh, I would say, uh, everything was going along fine, but the big event uh, of the 90s was the, was the beginning of our winter fantasy. For 20 years, the artists had had discussions about the possibility of having a winter show. And, uh, you know, when the summer shows, I mean, artists, they just live from show to show. That's just the way it is. And it was a long time from one summer to the next, and gosh, maybe we could do a winter show. And, and, and the winter show actually started out a lot like the first few years of the summer show. It had to get established. It needed to sink some roots and get uh, a foundation to it. And, and so it gradually grew and grew. Uh, and then uh, a year ago, we celebrated our 25th anniversary. And that show is just, I just love our Winter Fantasy show. The, we have uh, we 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 bring an artist from outside Laguna. One of our core values, uh, if I have time to share about our core values, is that you must be a Laguna Beach resident to show in the summer festival. But in the winter festival, we uh, we bring in uh, out of city artists, some which come from even out of state, and and so when you come to the Sardis, you'll see uh, some different art than you would see in the summer. And so that show has a different feel to it, but but the uh, the decorations and the and the lighting and just the feel to our grounds uh, at our winter fantasy is something special. It's it's just like a it's like a Santa's village, you know. And the, it, my grandkids, uh, some of my grandkids came the, the second weekend before we closed, and they were there all day long and still had things that they were looking to do you know it's just they just had a blast and um the artists don't do quite as well because we're only open uh, in the winter festival on the weekends where in the summer we're open every day uh, 66 or 67 straight days from uh, 10 in the morning till 10 at night you can tell that the artists are aging because like i said in the early years i think from 68 through the early 80s Maybe it was 1980, we were open till midnight, and then gradually we went to 11 o'clock, you know, and then people were going, oh, it's so late. And then we, so we went to 10 o'clock, and then we had a big meeting a few, couple of years ago. They wanted to bring it to 9 o'clock because everybody's getting old and needs to go to bed, you know, like myself. <laughs> so, uh, but we're going to, the 10 to 10 fits well for our advertising and um and so the Winter Fantasy has turned out to be just fabulous. And we had a great, uh, despite the one weekend in which there was a lot of rain, we, uh, we had a good, uh, tenants was great, and some of the sales for the artists were really excellent for the Winter Fantasy. In the 2000s, uh, from 2000, from the first year of the new millennium, uh, to 2006 were boomer years for us. The economy was healthy. Uh, the attendance didn't go up much, but the sales were super for the artist, and uh, and so those were those were great years for us. But then in 2007, as you all know, the uh, there was an economic collapse, of course, for the next three or four years, 
and we managed to hold our own. We hung in there. Uh, we didn't lose any staff. We uh, were able to, you know, trim some things in the budget, and and we managed to keep going. And then, about 2011, things uh, uh, turned around some, and uh, and as you all know, the economy got better. And um, into 2016, which was this past summer, was a year which uh, I just felt so proud. Uh, of the Sawdust artists, just most of the 200 artists at the Sawdust, we now have 200 artists. From 1968 to about 1990, we had 160 artists. And then, but we, we, we always had long waiting lists. There was one year we had 100 people on our waiting list, you know. And so we have a, a little bit of a seniority system where a number of artists get in who have been in the show, like my wife's been in the show since the beginning and artists have been in the show 30, 40 years. And then the rest, uh, because we're a non-juried show, we have a lottery on the first Saturday of February, which is coming up pretty soon. And uh, and the artists who don't have seniority then are picked by lottery, and um, so sometimes they don't they don't get in. When, uh, but um, we tr we, we've tried to figure out ways to get everybody in, and most years recently we've got just about everybody in. We do booth shares, and things like that. So um, our 50th was this past summer, and we did essentially like, I felt like two or three years work in one year. We, uh, the grounds were dramatically changed with a number of uh, installations uh, and innovations. You know, we have a, had a great mural on the outside of our show. We had great, uh, fresh new art on, uh, on the inside. We had our best-selling poster ever, created by um, legendary surf artist Bill Ogden, and uh, it it was a it was a superb year, and I I felt so proud because you know Steve Dictoro and and some of the uh, city council members. Well, Steve came and of course opened our show on opening day, but uh, Greg McGilvery, McGilvery Films did some promo videos for us and just the things that were said about the Sawdust, even so much to say that the Sawdust, you know, could be the very heart and soul of the art community here in Laguna. And I don't really want to say that, but it's certainly a big part of the heart and soul. I, mean, I know the Festival of Arts, I highly respect the Festival of Arts and everybody over there and, and the Art Affair too and all the galleries. It's, it's just, I mean, Laguna, like it, you just have to scratch yourself. Like, are we really living here? Like, in, in such a great place and a great town, and and uh, and to have you know three festivals. And you know, for me, I'm a little bit prejudiced. I just think the Sawdust is you know the best of the three. We get the most attendance. I'll, I could guess I could put that plug in. Uh, we have a hardworking staff, and um, I'm I'm just quite honored to be a part of it. Any hope on the? PowerPoint, no hope. Okay, well, uh, that's all right. So um, I think what I'd like to do is, uh, the Sawdust is uh, about our core values. Uh, uh, why, why has the Sawdust succeeded? What's, what's made it work well? Well, the passion, uh, uh, nothing works very well in life if there isn't passion in it. And um, so, I call I call the Sawdust uh, call the Sawdust a family, and we are a family, albeit a rather dysfunctional family a lot of the time with all the with infighting you know and stuff that goes on and you can imagine two hundred artists you know who are all like thinking they know what's right and how come the board's doing this and why don't we do something a different way and uh, and this and that but. Bottom line is, the folks at the Sawdust, the artists, the staff, and the board of directors, they love the show. And there's a lot of heart, and there is a lot of passion uh, in not only their love for the Sawdust, not only their love for the Sawdust, but also, also their love for each other. And we care for each other. Uh, you know, we've had a few artists pass, and when the, somebody passes, you just, you know, most of the sawdust turns out for it, and, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's, I feel so honored and privileged to be 
a part of a place that I consider um, as special as possibly could be in my life. And so I'm, great, I'm very grateful for that. So the passion of the artist, uh, the, ex uh, the excitement that builds, you know, as we go from booth picking to that second Tuesday in May when we start to build our booths, to opening day, the build up and watching the booths uh, every year. Uh, uh, you know, the city requires that we take our booths down every year. And so we had our winter fa fantasy and last week, uh, my wife's booth came down. And then in May, we start building a new booth. A and uh, oftentimes the artists will switch into a different booth location and they'll come up with a fresh and unique idea for their booth design. And, uh, and the grounds uh, have a fresh feel and a fresh look to it. The, uh, I would like to be able to go back to the 70s when we could put booths anywhere, kind of. But the fire department said you have to have these two exit fire lanes, you know. And, and so this, we have certain restrictions now that kind of keep us in certain areas. But if I had my way, which I don't, we would just we would have lots of booths everywhere in different formations, and and uh, it would be a little a little different every year, uh, more different than it is now. But the so some of our core values uh, I think would be uh, important to share with you. Uh, the first being for the summer show, which I already mentioned, that you need to be a, a Laguna Beach resident. And um, I might say that that's a concern right now uh, about being a Laguna Beach resident. Because back in the 70s, when I married my wife, our rent was $100 a month. And there were a lot of artists living for less than that in little studios and bungalows around town. Now, you can hardly find a place to live for $3,000 a month. I mean, it's just tough for an artist to live in Laguna and, and, uh, and be able to keep staying here a year after year. So we made, we've tried to ease some of that a little bit by uh, saying um, artists who have been in the show 10 years are now able to move out, uh, out of town if they've established 10 years uh, of residency here uh, in, the, in Laguna. They're able to move uh, out of town and then, and then stay in the show. So that's, that's helped some, and it gives some artists in Laguna and more opportunity to be in the show also. And, um, and we absolutely require that every item sold in someone's booth is handmade by them, at least 75% of what you look at when you go buy a sawdust booth, 75% of that has been created by the artist himself or herself. And uh, we stay as true as we can to that. In fact, we have a what we call our presentation day coming up in a week. And uh, the artists, except for those with a lot of seniority, bring their art in and the board of directors will look at the art and and uh, make sure that that you know nobody's buying something out of a catalog um, or buying it from China or somewhere and and uh, trying to you know sneak it in, which does not happen very much, but occasionally does happen. And so uh, we want to make sure that when you come to the festival that uh, what you see has been made by the artist. We also have an extraordinary high value for when you come to this artist that there are workshops for you. There, there are programs that you can uh, become a part of. You can come to this artist, create your own work. You can throw a pot, you can paint a painting. Uh, we have ongoing uh, demonstrations by all the artists. We require the artists to uh, demonstrate in their booths a number of hours every week. And uh, that's part of the contract that they ag agree to. And so often when you come to this artist, uh, you'll see artists working right there in front of you. Uh, and that's a great value. We have uh, also um, a great educational program in which uh, uh, we have schools come to the grounds. We, uh, we go to schools and, and do workshops for kids. And um, 
uh, I can't say enough for how that has increased and grown over the years. I think in the late 70s, we started, uh, we started workshops for the kids and, and uh, hands-on projects, and um, that, has, that has grown and grown. So uh, that, that value of when you come to the Sawdust, you can, you can uh, make something yourself and take it home. Um, that, that's something that we're really pleased to offer to you. And then uh, as, we, um, as we started the winter fantasy in the 90s, we have gradually become a year-around uh, art venue now. We offer what we call SSAC classes, studio art classes at the Sawdust, in which you can, um, every single week, we offer classes. You can check our schedules online. From from glass blowing to jewelry making to to leather crafts to all kinds of things, um, and so we now are a year-round art venue, and uh, we are proud to be uh, have our gates open uh, every, every single day. So I'm going to uh, also uh, talk to you about some of the key uh, key people, and along with some of the values that we. Uh, that I feel like if we didn't have these values or these folk, um, I'm not so sure we, we would have lasted. Our first president in 1968 on our current grounds was Hal Pastorius. He uh, carried us through the first couple of years. Uh, he was honored this past year with a, a sculpture that you may have seen over at the bus depot. Uh, his wife, uh, Hal passed, but his wife uh, who has been living in Australia. She came this summer and visited, and we now have a permanent uh, sculpture of his on our grounds uh, in the back of our uh, up, upper part of our grounds. And uh, Hal uh, was a strong, good leader, and that's what we needed. We had lots of artists with lots of passion, but you need somebody to say, stop. Okay, we, we've heard all these ideas, and. This is the direction we're going. He was that that kind of guy. He was a man who who uh, was respected and and loved. And then I mentioned Ed Van Dusen, who was such a uh, a great businessman and able to deal with the city. Uh, Dolores Farrell was another one who gave her heart and soul to the Sawdust uh, for a number of years. Uh, Marilyn Zapp, Frank Torriello, Larry Doty, uh, Tom Leslie. And these are. Uh, men, Tracy Mascalatola, who is on the board right now, has been on more boards. I think she's served as a board member over over 30 years now, all, all together. So it's these people who love the sawdust, and uh, we had the right. I think we had the right combination of great artists and good leadership uh, emerge from the sawdust, and 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 we were able to uh, we were able to uh, grow and and change, and it was a great blessing for uh, us to have that kind of uh, ki that kind of leadership. Uh, we also have uh, a great set of bylaws and show rules that that govern um, uh, everything that we do. And uh, of course, uh, the artists want bylaws and show rules, but the state also requires it. Um, and we uh, have a great accounting system also at the Sawdust. And the, so the Sawdust, we are, uh, more fiscally, uh, financially, uh, we're right now in our strongest season that we've ever been. And I'm um, very, very pleased to, to feel that kind of stability because there's been years that we've had to go to the bank to borrow money to open up and all of that has gradually changed because of our staff and our CPA and leadership. And um, so um, I'm uh, really, really happy to be able to um, say that the Sawdust is probably in a healthier place now on just about uh, any and every level than we have ever been. So, all right. Um, I think maybe we could take some questions if anybody has questions. Questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, comments, yes. Judy, right? Hi, Judy, how are you? It's good to see you again. I coached Judy's son in uh, boys club basketball, I think, one year. <laughs> how are you? Yes, uh, 
and forgive me for not mentioning that, uh, we have great uh, entertainment. We have uh, uh, entertainment on our main deck or somewhere on the grounds uh, from 11 o'clock in the morning until closing. And we have some uh, of the best entertainment that you'll find uh, anywhere. Um, and just, uh, if you've ever been to the Sawdust on a Friday or Saturday night, you know, and just locally, from Jason Fetty to the Missiles of October to Upstream to World Anthem, when those uh, groups show up, I mean, really, the Sawdust just rocks. It, uh, the stage is full, and we have a good time. We have a good time. There's lots of dancing going on and fun. and. I think the sawdust, you know, one of the adjectives is the sawdust is just a lot of fun there. I mean, it's just great. It's great to go there. It's not, you just don't go to a craft show. You go to, it's, uh, sawdust is an experience. It's an experience of life, of, of everywhere you look, you know, there's landscape, there's waterfalls, there's fresh art, there's some booth, there's some artist that's just cool, you know, and it's just, it's, it's endless joy for uh, we get the letters and the emails and the comments from literally thousands of customers who say, I loved every minute of the sawdust that I was there. So the entertainment and also we have good food. I, I, I think our, when you go there, you can, we, in fact, we have a lot of people that just come to the sawdust to buy a season pass and they have lunch there or they have dinner. And we have... Um, you know, we have Gigi's Cafe in there, and we, we have a, a good uh, Mexican restaurant and a deli, you know, and and uh, some healthy food. And, of course, we have a nice tavern there, too, and a couple of s screens, you know, for the the husbands that want to watch a game while their wives run around and have fun. And so, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, yes. Well, would you wait till you can get some microphone over there? Yeah. Well, oh, okay. Otherwise, people on the cable sure. can't hear you. <laughs> sure. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How are you? What's your name? Janice. Hi, Janice. Yes. Um, can you tell me in terms of money, do you get money from the city or is all the money that comes into the sawdust from admissions or? The, the huge majority of the money uh, comes from our attendance. Okay. We um, also have a gift shop in which uh, so, some money's come in. The exhibitors are charged a fee also to show. Not, it's not an exorbitant fee. Uh, we get an occasional grant, but uh, no, we don't get any extra money from the city. Yes, well, uh, I, I wouldn't mind it, <laughs> but uh, and, uh, the city has been very good to us. Uh, they were very, they've been very helpful no, when we've had uh, planning commission issues or board of design issues or things like that. They've always been cooperative and great, uh, and and the. Uh, Fire marshals and fire chief and city manager. Ken Frank was great when he was city uh, manager, and everybody since him has have been great. And uh, you know, Wyland people like Wyland got to start at the Sawdust. Uh, you know, when he first started doing art, he started at the Sawdust, and um, of course, grown in one of the most successful artists anywhere. And uh, Ron Rodecker, who did Dragon Tales on television, was an artist for many years at the Sawdust, and there's a number of others who. Uh, Diane Wright created a, a Mandela that was in Life Magazine and is world renowned for that piece of art. So, very proud, of, very proud of our artist. We have another artist. question at the back there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that is interesting that the um, city and the pageant seem to be much more supportive of the Festival of Arts, or the pageant and the Festival of Arts worked together right since the '30s, and yeah, then the I, city. Then the city was, I, I believe, it, <laughs> maybe the Festival of Arts and the pageant has, have different views on this, has been more supportive of that festival than the, the Sawdust. I mean, it's, it's a tribute to the Sawdust that it hasn't had the same right. kind of support. And, and perhaps that's one reason why I know at the festival you can bring liquor and food in, unlimited, it seems, but you cannot do the same at all, bring in even an ounce of liquor food to the sod. It's kind of interesting mm -hmm. contrast. So, yeah. And I, I support all the, that the city does for the Festival of Arts. And uh, uh, what, I don't know all the logistics and legal, legal, legalities of what goes on between the city and the Festival of Arts, but uh, we work with the Festival of Arts and the Art Affair on a, on a 
passport and and uh, I I've never felt anything but but support from the from the city. I've never felt like the Festival of Arts was favored. In fact, there's such an independent spirit at the Sawdust. I don't know if we really, you know, in the beginning would have wa even wanted that. You know, I'm not saying that we would turn it down now or something, but, <laughs> <laughs> but all I can say is that uh, the, the, I, I'm grateful for, especially in our 50th this past summer, the city just really, the, I mean, the fire marshal came out, and everybody, we all worked together and to make it happen, and um, I'm, I was very pleased with how we were treated by the city here. Yeah, financially, it's another issue, and, but we have provided our, made our own way, and it's worked well. Yes, um, hi. I, oh. Giselle. I hi, how thank are you? you. This is Giselle. Thank you, Pastor oh. Jay. Um, <laughs> so I am from Santa Ana, so I yes. really enjoyed that part of information, getting the couple of pieces from out of Santa Ana. I was born in 81, uh -huh. so it wasn't too far away right. from 65 and all that stuff there. Um, but art comes from everywhere, and yes. I'm glad that the city allowed um, the rejects, <laughs> I read the program, to express their 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 artistic side. Yes. Um, and, you know, um, I, I have an artistic side. I'm from Santa Ana, not from Laguna Beach. Right. But you did get some pieces from my part of the town. <laughs> and I'm sure we didn't complain about it. <laughs> and so it's really nice that you're allowing people that, that somehow um, maybe that w was a blessing in disguise that people are now able to come um, from out of Laguna Beach yeah. um, to, to spread their art since our art was spread it over here some way, somehow. But um, it was not a question in particular, just on Thank you. congratulating. Um, obviously, it's like 20-something years from 65 or something like well, that. As I, said, as I said, the Winter Fantasy, we do encourage uh, out-of-city artists, and I would encourage you Thank for you. the Winter Fantasy 2017 to put an application in if you've got some art you'd like to sell. Thank you. <laughs> could, I, could I ask? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, you mentioned that Artists have to take their booze down every yes. year, and I know you like that because it changes the look. But That's right. um, I'm concerned about the environmental ramifications of not of that. Um, does all that wood get recycled, or what happens to all it? Of, almost all of the wood that artists, if you come into my home and walk behind my garage, <laughs> you're going to see a stack of wood that I've been using since 19. 90 but does everyone two. do that? I mean, is Most it a requirement? You, you can't. The price of wood right now, if you go to Ganal Lumber and you buy enough wood to build a 10 by 10 booth, it's going to be a lot of money. So the artists save their, their wood. And probably the only thing that would get thrown out is some drywall that splinters and breaks up. But mm -hmm. no. And by the way, like we love wood at the Sawdust. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the early booze for not not even the early booze i say the first third of our history almost all the booze were seasoned barn wood and it uh, had that uh great look you know of going into a, a kind of a ghost town feel you know and but but i just i'm sorry to be so persistent but what how does that work if you have to fit your wood to a different space every year you sometimes you got to cut a log you don't want to cut and i i yeah okay. so like I could tell you a story about, like I had, I went, used to go to mines in Colorado when I took a trip there with my friends and I'd bring back wood I'd find, you know, and uh, so I hired this new booth, booth builder one, one year. I had one by 12, 10 foot, 100 year old planks, boards. And I gave them to him to build my booth and he cut most of them in half. Mm. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I, I, I'm still not over it. <laughs> I'm still hyperventilating, and that was back, I can't even remember now, but, and one of the great tragedies in my own personal life, let me tell you, I, like, I can remember most of the wood that I used in my booze for all those early years, and then, unfortunately, in the 1993 firestorm, my wood pile burned, and when I, when I got back to my property, <laughs> <laughs> not the fire. When I got back to my 
Oh, look at what happened. <laughs> People started clapping when I said my house burned. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. Marilyn, that was you. <laughs> so do we, have, do we have time to show some pictures now? Yes. Well, yeah. yeah, we'll show a few. All right. Uh, um, if, if you would indulge me one moment, the uh, television or the recording here evidently didn't get the, uh, the introduction I gave. It is very short. If you don't mind, I'll do it again. And we'll get it on the tape. Okay. Uh, Jay Grant is a 47-year Laguna Beach resident, happily married to his wife, Nikki, for 43 years, has two sons and six grandchildren. He's a published author of three books and wrote a weekly column in the Coastline News for 10 years. Jay has been involved at the Sawdust Festival for 43 years, serving 35 years as sales manager, six years on the board of directors, and the last two years as the Sawdust president. Jay's wife, Nikki, is one of the founders of the Sawdust Festival. Jay is also a pastor and teacher at the Little Church by the Sea here on Laguna Beach. So right at this point, let's give him a hand. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you, Ed. Yeah, it's really, I, I could talk about the Sadas forever. Uh, like, it's just family and by heart, and I, I wish I had like four hours I could talk about. But before we let you all go, and we'll continue with this. But I'd like to let you know the next few programs of the Historical yes. Society. Okay. And uh, Eric Jessen, who's standing in the back there, is going to be putting on the next two programs. If you've ever heard Eric, you know he's good. And uh, we'll, he's going to be speaking on the history of Laguna's beaches. Yo. The part one will be March 14th. Part two will be April 6th. And then on May 10th, Mary Ray will be here to talk about members of the St. Clair family and their contributions to art here. So we hope you're in, you'll come again, and we'll continue with as much of this as we can. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. You're very gracious, and I so appreciate on the kind words. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna, we'll just go through this quickly, uh, and this will give you a feel. Uh, a Frank, okay, so this was a go back, go back one slide. So this is this is the sawdust grounds in 1932. Oh, where are we at? We okay now, Frankie? So this is the sawdust grounds in 1932. In 1932. There were cabins built on the present sawdust grounds for the United States Olympic swim team. And they built cabins there for them to sleep in at night, and they trained for the 32 Olympics off Main Beach, right there in our ocean, right there. And so those cabins went up, and then when, when the Olympics were done, uh, it became Songer's Camp, it became a tourist site, and uh, and the grounds at the Sawdust in the 30s and 40s was a place you'd come if you lived out of town, rent cabins, and come to Laguna. So that, that's what the first two slides are. So this is the first year of the Sawdust, 1968. And you'll notice on the right side of that picture, there's a driveway. Well, when we bought the property, uh, Dorothy and Walter Funk, who owned the property, had six uh, motel units on the back of the Sawdust grounds. It was a motel that had been where Coast Hardware is now, and they got a flatbed truck, and they moved it over there. And there were six people living in those uh, units for the first couple of years of the Sawdust. Uh, one lady was named Miss Courage, and she would have people pick her up. The car would drive right through the middle of our show, <laughs> back, to her, back to her little cottage, and then exit out. And that's, we had to, that's, that, the funks, that was part of their income. And, and, that I think was maybe two years, three years before that ended, and and then we used them for a the, those cottages for watchmen and maintenance people. So th here's some pictures, uh, a 1968 picture right here of our front of our show. This is uh, on the left is Bob Young, a uh, renowned painter whose a lot of his art's been in chart houses. On the right, Dolores Farrell, uh, the president of the 1967 show. There's our first Sawdust poster. We love our posters. That was our 68 poster. And there's the, there's the crane that w uh, Bob Young found in a junkyard in Santa Ana. Uh, and the kids are climbing it. Do you think they get away with that today? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, there's Diane Wright, who I mentioned. Uh, he uh, annually gets the best artist of the Sawdust Award. Uh, this is Joe Miller. Uh, bent down there, uh, he was one of our uh, primary artists, uh, founding member, and uh, quite the character. This, my wife's 
uh, at my wife's booth in 1969. Uh, and she shared it with a couple of other folks, but I, I slipped her in there just so I could. Uh, it was a nice booth. There's Marla Burns, who is still at the Sawdust and is on our board of directors. Yeah. There's just some of our artists. Um, a good friend of mine in front with all the hair and beard, Tim Honey. This is my favorite picture. Doug Miller took this picture right here during booth building carrying that log somewhere, but that captures, that captures the 70s for sure. There's a, a picture from across the street up on the hill of the sawdust. I think it's a fantastic picture. This is one of the best booths we ever had. Earl Reed, jeweler Earl Reed, built a log cabin booth. There's another picture, if you can see the activity, the sawdust, our flags, kind of the feel for it. That's the, a line in 1976, or actually 1975. And uh, what year is it, Frankie? Do we know? I can't remember. 76, yeah. And you can see we had good crowds that lined up. There's Tom Shannon's booth right there, and on the right's Irene Suez's booth. She, uh, Irene and, and Nikki, my wife here, are the only two founding members who've done the sawdust every single year without missing since the beginning. <laughs> That's my brother-in-law, Mark Blumenfeld, on the left, Nikki's brother, and on the right is Bud Ware's booth. This is the most famous booth we've ever had. This is Star Shields, the face painter at the Sadus who made a spaceship in 1973, and I heard that uh, Robert Plank from Led Zeppelin came disguised just to see this booth at the Sadus. <laughs> There's some more uh, of our early architecture. You can see how high the booths go. Lauren Chapman began our, uh, our glass blowing demo booth. He's still at the Sawdust. He showed last summer. There's Doug Miller. And I'm proud to say that Doug is the Laguna Beach Patriot's Day Parade Citizen of the Year next March. There's David and Rosalind, who are now New Orleans street musicians. They came to the Sawdust uh, every summer for about 15 years, kind of raised their kids there. And there's one of our early uh, posters. This Caprice in the middle, that's a mime troupe. Uh, we have all kinds of entertainment, not just uh, music, but mime. And the next photo, I think you'll see juggling. And those two jugglers there ended up, they were so good, they ended up, I can't remember their names now, I wish I could, uh, ended up in Las Vegas. There's our art demo program. What year was this, Frankie? 79, we started uh, uh, kids coming to the Sawdust and giving them projects, and it's never stopped. The, <laughs> the booth on the left, that's Kirk Millett with the crashed airplane. And then on the right, you can see our facade in the set, one of the years in the 70s. So there's one of our facades from the 80s. You can get that, that art deco feel. Fred Bond, Fred Bond, uh, Bob Bond's dad, uh, some of you might know the Bond family, I uh, came up with that design. That's a 1984 facade right there. That's, our, uh, not, that's one of our most popular um, posters uh, created by Mary Ella Warren, and uh, that's our, that was our 82 poster. There's a picture of the sawdust grounds. That's 1989, the year our facade was built. And that's the crowds outside opening day before the gates were open to let them in. It's just one of our better booths in the, I think in the 80s. That is Fred Bond's booth. He was famous for his trains and airplanes. So that uh, on the left is a poster created by Ray Caruso who does scrimshot at the sawdust. If you look closely at the, at the trees, the names of areas of Laguna are in the tree. If you look closely, Canyon Acres, Skyline, if you look closely, you can read the names. Uh, he, the, it's, it's a fantastic poster. I think, think that thing is so great. And the poster on the right, you can, does anybody know who created that? Scott Moore created that poster on the right. All right, two more of our, our booths. Uh, I love the saw, the Kirk Millette, that's a, a second booth. 
He just comes up with some great ideas. That's Doug Miller's train that, and whatever year that was, got the best booth award for that train. You can see what goes into these booths, you guys. Like it's it's pretty amazing. Always found items, yeah. So there's a one of our early Winter Fantasy posters. And on the right, some of you who came to the early years of the Winter Fantasy, we had these two ladies that came every year on stilts. It was pretty cool. It's Carolers, it's one of our big, uh, wonderful attractions. And here's a picture of the Winter Fantasy. Santa Claus, the kids love him. All right, the poster on the left was one of our best-selling posters that's created by Linda Peary, who now lives in Hawaii. And Danita Lloyd uh, did the poster on the right. Yeah, uh, nobody in Laguna can do water, ocean, like Danita Lloyd. She's just fantastic. That's uh, Kelly Aiken's uh, poster f uh, from the 2015 show. It's a view of the um, saloon area looking out towards the booze. That is Gary Spellman's booth. Somebody do, told me that Gary's here tonight, that Gary painted their dog. Who, who told me that? Somebody that was here. Yeah, okay. Uh, he, 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 Gary's also responsible for, if you drove by the Sawdust Festival in the last month and saw all the lights in the front of the Sawdust, he put them all up. Bill Darnall, the ceramics teacher at the high school for 30 some years and his, and his wife Patty and then on the right side is just a great booth uh, created by um, Isaac Anderson. There's Mr. Wyland. He now comes to the Sawdust every summer and does a, a art project for the kids. What's it called, um, Frankie? On Green Day, he comes. Yeah, we have a special Green Day every year. We have fashion shows at the Sawdust. And I love this. This was from two years ago. Uh, at um, the coastline, did a great five-page feature with lots of color pictures. One of our best shows we ever have presented. There's Christopher Jeffries uh, from a couple of years ago, actually 2007. Um, it's a great, you get a great feel for uh, creating a, a piece of hand-blown glass. There's some more uh, of our hands-on projects for the kids that come. My good friend Barb Shupi and her husband Ken on the left, they build great booze. They got one of the best booth awards this year. And on the right is Linda Perry, who created that one poster I mentioned. Uh, she now lives in, uh, I think, Maui. There's our general manager, Tom Klingemeyer. <laughs> Most of you know him, uh, being painted by Hugo Rivera, who has a gallery on Coast Highway and actually did a workshop at the Sawdust this morning. That's the pawn shop king, Scott and Joel. Uh, they come, they're regulars, they have big following. Um, they were called by Rolling Stone Magazine last year, one of the top 10 new and upcoming duos. Another picture of our summer show. Here's another uh, one of our different kind of entertainers. Uh, we have all kinds of great entertainment. I wish I could remember everything. Another great picture of our grounds. There's our van. We had, we had more, more people take pictures of that van. You could go in the van and get your picture taken in the van last summer. And it was, that van was, with people in it, was all over social media. Everywhere you looked, that thing popped up. Yeah. And there is a, our 50th poster. This thing, uh, Bill Ogden, I, he and I talked on the phone. He lives in the desert. We talked for six months in coming up with this design and this poster. We worked through various ideas. He and I talked and met, and, and this was the result. I think it's the greatest poster uh, that this artist ever had. Yeah. And there's our last slide, the front of our Sada. So as far as I'd like to... Uh, hear from you is just a round of applause for all the Sawdust artists because they, they just make the Sawdust something special in Laguna. And especially for Jay. 
thank you all for coming. I'm sure there'll be some informal conversation now, but we'll bring the formal program to an end here. We hope that if you haven't been there recently, you'll visit us at the Murphy Smith Bungalow, which is on Ocean between uh, Whole Foods and uh, Wells Fargo Bank. And we're open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 1 to 4 p.m. Thank you for coming.